I'm waiting to make. Bienvenue, welcome everyone to, and thank you for coming to the 44th event of Disrupting Disruptions, the Feminist and Accessible Publishing, Communications and Technologies Practices Speaker Workshop Series. Today's event is co-sponsored by the Initiative for Indigenous Futures. Jason Lewis and Scott Winati will be speaking in a moment about the Initiative for Indigenous Futures. I'm Dr. Alex Ketchum, and I'm a professor of feminist and social justice studies at McGill and the organizer of this series. The Feminist and Accessible Publishing, Communications, and Technologies Practices Speaker and Workshop Series seeks to bring together scholars, creators, and people in industry working at the intersections of digital humanities, computer science, feminist studies, disability studies, communication studies, LGBTQ studies, history, and critical race theory. We're hosting 10 virtual events this fall. You can find our full schedule as well as video, video recordings of our past events at disruptingdisruptions.com. So that's the redirect URL, disruptingdisruptions.com. You can also find our list of sponsors, including Shirk, Milieu, Mila, and the Indigenous Futures Lab. For this event, recording is enabled. So the event can be possibly embedded on our website, but don't worry, only the speakers will be shown in the video. We also have a Q&A option available. So throughout the talk, you may type your questions in the Q&A answer box. You can see it at the bottom of your screen, and there'll be time at the end for our speakers, Caroline Running Wolf and Michael Running Wolf to answer them. We can't guarantee that every question will be answered, but we are grateful to the discussion that you generate. Thank you to our captioner for today, Kelly. Past series speakers Susan Kite and Jess McLean have pointed to the physical and material impacts of the digital world. While the events this semester are virtual, everything that we do is tied to the land and the space that we are on. The virtual is tied to the earth. Furthermore, as the series seeks to draw attention to power relations that have been invisibilized, it's important to acknowledge Canada's long colonial history and current political practices. Two of the hosting universities for today's event are located in Jijogue, Montreal on unceded Ganyangahaga territory. Furthermore, the ongoing organizing efforts across this continent, such as the organizing by the Wessalon people at the Unistone camp, make clear the ever-present and ongoing colonial violence in Canada. Interwoven with this history of colonization is one of enslavement and racism. For example, the series is affiliated with the IGSF of McGill University. The university's namesake, James McGill, enslaved Black and Indigenous peoples. It was in part from the money he acquired through these violent acts that McGill University was founded. These histories are here with us in this space and inform the conversations we have today. I encourage you to learn about the lands that you are on. Nativeland.ca is a fantastic resource. Now I'm going to turn it over to Jason and Scott Winati from the Initiative for Indigenous Futures. So. Can you hear me? Okay. Sego sego guego. Skawanari ni waksanoda. At no wara ni wagi daroda. Ganyange haga ni wago wanjoda. Gahnawagi ni daragay dun. Nekzi jojage gidarong. My name is Skawanari and I am a Mohawk, Ganyange haga from Gahnawage, which is a reserve very close to Jojage or Montreal, where I am broadcasting from right now. And I'm just going to welcome you with the Ohandu Gariwatekwa, which is to say the words before all else, only I'm going to give you a very, very short version. I'm actually just going to say the very first verse, which gives thanks for the people. And so I will proceed. Aguego Oska Andede Watwinuni, the people. And so we bring our minds together as one to greet and thank the people. The people are given the duty to live in balance and harmony with each other and with all living things. And we should remind ourselves regularly that we are meant to love one another and be kind to one another and bring our minds together to do the work necessary to make this world the just place and the abundant place that it was meant to be. That is my, that is my, those are my words I share with you. And I did mean to leave some things out. There are many more things to thank in the interest of time. I hope I can be forgiven for not uh, saying each of them, 
but they are important and I hope that each of you can give thanks in your own way, in your own minds, at your own moment. And now I pass it on to Jason. Mahalo. Yep. Uh, so good evening, everybody. I'm Jason Lewis, the director of the Initiative for Indigenous Futures. Uh, I appreciate you, Alex, inviting us to co-sponsor this talk this evening. Uh, the Feminist and Accessible Publishing Communications and Technologies Practice Series is one of my favorite speaker series, and I'm thankful to be able to collaborate with you again. <clears throat> the Initiative for Indigenous Futures, or IF, is a partnership of universities and community organizations dedicated to developing multiple visions of Indigenous people tomorrow in order to better understand where we need to go today. IF is anchored by Aboriginal Territories in Cyberspace, or ABTEC, a research network based at Concordia University that I co-direct with Scott Winati. Uh, in 2019, IF, along with Angie Abdilla and O.E.V. Parker-Jones, organized the Indigenous Protocol and Artificial Intelligence Workshops in Honolulu, Hawaii. These workshops looked at how Indigenous knowledge frameworks could and should inform the development of advanced computational systems such as artificial intelligence. One of the many, many pleasures of those workshops was finally meeting Michael and Caroline. I've been hearing about them for a while um, with several people telling me that I needed to meet them. And was that ever true? Uh, they're doing such necessary work at the intersection of indigenous knowledge, technology, language, and culture. And it's been such a pleasure to get to know you, to hang out with you around the pool and learn about your work. So now I'm gonna do the official bio for the bios for the two of you. So Caroline Running Wolf from the Crow Nation, nay Old Coyote, is an enrolled member of the Opsa, uh, I didn't do this before on Opsa Luca Nation uh, in <laughs> Montana. <laughs> I don't think that was right from the expression. You can say Crow yeah. Well, Sorry the, about that, Caroline. Well, use the common lingua. <laughs> <laughs> With a Swabian German mother and also Pikuni, Aglola, and Ho Chunk heritage. As the daughter of nomadic parents, she grew up between USA, Canada, and Germany. Thanks to her genuine interest in people and their stories, she is a multilingual cultural acclamation artist dedicated to supporting indigenous language and culture vitality. After working for over 15 years as a professional nerd herder and business consultant in various, various fields, Running Wolf co-founded a nonprofit, Buffalo Tongue, with her husband, Michael. Together, they create virtual and augmented reality experiences to advocate for Native American voices, languages, and cultures. Running Wolf has a master's degree in Native American studies from Montana State University in Bozeman, Montana. She is currently pursuing her PhD in anthropology at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. Caroline's PhD research explores potential applications of immersive technologies and artificial intelligence to effectively enhance indigenous language and culture reclamation. She's also passionate about indigenous data sovereignty and AI ethics. And now Michael. Want me to read it? Yeah. Michael. Running Wolf, Northern Cheyenne, Lakota Blackfeet, was raised in a rural prairie village in Montana with intermittent water and electricity. Naturally, he has a master's of science in computer science, is a former engineer for Amazon's Alexa, and is an instructor at Northeastern University. He was raised with a grandmother who only spoke his tribal language, Cheyenne, which like many indigenous languages is near extinction. By leveraging his advanced degree and professional engineering experience, Michael hopes to strengthen the ecology of thought represented by the Indigenous. Michael is pursuing Indigenous language and culture reclamation using immersive technologies such as AR and VR and artificial intelligence. He's an AI ethicist and is currently building an automatic speech recognition system for Indigenous languages in the Pacific Northwest. So Michael and Caroline, we're super happy to see you again and happy that you can join us at least virtually on our territory and uh, are super excited to hear what you're gonna have to say tonight. Thank you so much. And thank you for those very warm welcomes. <laughs> yeah, so welcome everybody. Um, we, we were gonna just give you a general overview of a lot of the things that we're working on. And uh, as you heard, both Michael and I are uh, the stereotypical uh, feather horse, buffalo, plains, tribes members. Um, and something that all of us have in common, regardless of whether we fought on one side for or against the cavalry, <laughs> is um is that 
our languages are endangered and that we have to work hard to to reclaim them and to keep them thriving and and so this is something that michael and i are very passionate about um anything else yeah oh yeah um maybe just you know in in general the uh the languages that we're working with right now in the pacific northwest are Kwakwala and Kwikwetechuk. Um, and they're they're very different from Crow and, and Northern Cheyenne, uh, both in language and culture. But you know, like I said, something we all have in common is the the language needs needs some some action. And one of the things we share with the uh, indigenous of and this is the United States, but obviously this is also true in, in Canada. Is that uh, in the blue areas on the right, you can see where our populations are concentrated, and we're in basically the flyover states, quote unquote. And we're also, if you correlate the two, compared to the the city lights of the the left side, we're in the dark spots. You know, like I grew up in the one of the deepest, darkest, dark spots in the top left of the map. That is Montana, and Similarly, we were right next to uh, the Abzalaga and or the Crow, the, the enemy hated enemy tribe. <laughs> but we, like like mentioned earlier in my biography, uh, we 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 just lack basic access. Like we lack basic access to water and electricity, and never mind the internet. And we don't necessarily even have access to basic educational systems. Like a lot of communities struggle just to teach mathematics. Never mind computer science. Well, and then on, on top of it all, you know, third thing that we can uh, definitely say we all have in common is that there's that there's this uh, high risk of cultural appropriation going on, and and this cultural appropriation goes so far as even dare we say stealing our languages, selling them back to us, and and um, yeah, taking our taking our data, and so there's there's a lot of work that needs to be done in that field as well, and um, yeah, yeah. And specifically, we've as colonization that has impacted us, uh, like all the other tribes of the Americas, is that our material culture has been exploited, and our, we we often do not have access to our own cultural heritage in the form of material culture, like. For instance, here, this is a Alkyde scraper, and we no longer make them uh, since the, since they they were, they were largely obsolete, and we also um, they've been stolen. So typically, an Alkyde scraper, as seen here, is a Blackfeet object, um, and we it's at least three hundred years old and potentially three thousand years old, and it currently resides in private hands. And so, when we begin this journey, we we knew that we had a lot of our culture and ways outside. They were stolen from us either through graft or maybe just, you know, accidentally people just selling things they didn't realize were significant to us as a cultural. And so, and so you had these archite scrapers that just very rarely reside in indigenous hands. Um, and so this one is a good example of what we did to reclaim our culture was to 3D scan it using photogrammetry. And Caroline, maybe you can speak to you a little bit. Uh, there's a big problem with this uh, photo, <laughs> trying to do photogrammetry on a smooth object so, like this. Yeah, so in case you're wondering why there's all this other stuff around, it, it was 72 hours of my life uh, trying to get a 3D scan of this of this beautiful um, elk hide scraper. And, and um, we, we were very grateful that the private collector allowed us to spend those 72 hours with, with the uh, cultural objects and um, <clears throat> trying all different methods. And this was, in the end, what worked was, you know, having, having all these moccasins lined up and all these other, other uh, reference points for, for the software. And the idea is that we wanted to, to utilize well also in addition to just you know have it at least virtually um, also be able to utilize it in a virtual environment where where you could then look at it 
up close and, and look at the details, there's, there's markings that are star constellations on it. Um, and yeah, so it, it was it was a lot of hard work to even get to this point. <laughs> I think I think this traumatized Caroline. <laughs> but it but it sort of shows the work we were doing, just trying to get in and the specific project we were trying to do this was on the Buffalo uh, Buffalo Jump. Buffalo Jump hunt. Um, yeah. And and so basically, yeah, that's that's what that's what our journey is all about, is that we're convinced that accessible uh, technology and ideally immersive indigenous technology <clears throat> can help um, with that reclamation of language and culture and also reclaiming our identities and our worldviews. And, and the best way to do that, uh, in our opinion, is, is to do it in close collaboration driven by the community and, and the community goals um, to, to be very mindful of that community's protocols um, and, and you know, respect their data sovereignty and also empower them uh, to, to be able to do this kind of work on their own later on by building capacity uh, within the community so that, you know, they can they can use technology in the way that they want to without having to deal with outsiders like us, for example. And from an engineering perspective, this means that this technology needs to exist in the dark areas of that map. It needs to exist offline and with be low entry, low technical entry, and have a be accessible to everyone. Not you don't need to have a high-speed internet access to use this technology. And you shouldn't need to spend $1,000 for a specific iPhone just to use the technology. You're very deeply interested in building technology that is cheap, easily reproducible, and accessible. And also accessible in the sense of that it doesn't necessarily have to have a perfect internet connection, that it can be off offline as well. Um, So, and then as, as Jason mentioned earlier, there was this uh, wonderful indigenous protocols and artificial intelligence uh, workshop series um, that finally brought us together with this amazing group of, of very diverse individuals from, from all over uh, North America, Canada, um, well, North America is also Canada, uh, but also New Zealand, Australia, um, Hawaii, and, and people with very different backgrounds, um, artists, cultural knowledge holders, language keepers, scholars, technologists, scientists, governance experts. It was amazing. It was, it was a really great time um, where we had so many great conversations, learned so much. And um, in the second workshop and after the second workshop, we then wrote this position paper. Um, I, I included the website and that's where you can also uh, access the position paper. And it's, it's uh, yeah, it's definitely worth your time checking that out. And one of the things that Michael and I did during our time there was um, we created a mobile image recognition app. Do you want to talk? Yeah, so what happened was that Jason gathered together uh, four, actually several mini nerds, <laughs> mini computer nerds, and a handful of us were actually engineers and with a hard computer background, like myself, uh, Caleb, um, Joel, and then Caroline and Nolani were sort of our nerd herders, um, but they both had technical uh, technical aptitude. And we decided, what are we going to do? We would, why don't we just build something? Uh, since we're all together, how often do you get to work with an entirely indigenous team? And so we kind of ideated. We spent the first day thinking about what we wanted to build. Kind of drew up like feasibilities of what we were going to do, and we decided to build a simple object recognition uh, AI uh, application that translated the world into Hawaiian. 
And so I was more on the technical side, uh, actually implementing the, the AI model, uh, which was open source, and then the application infrastructure. Meanwhile, Caroline and Nolani, maybe you can speak to more of that, or actually were creating and figuring out the words for the application. Yeah, I was I was all over the place. Um, it was Noilani and I, and Isaac Ikaaka uh, were mainly the ones um, looking at the words, and also um, Isaac and me. We were looking at how how to best do the UI, the user interface design, so that it doesn't use English um, to to help people stay immersed in the language. And uh, one of one of the things, I mean, we we really like showing this because it's it's a very simple, um, small application that has some impact. And one of the things we would love to to do in the future is add audio. Like right now, it just shows you the word, um, how it's written. But if you don't know how to pronounce that, then you're still Going, going to struggle. Um, so in the future, we would love to add audio to that. And the key takeaway we took, a, took from this was that, so the AI that we used was off the shelf. Uh, it was open source uh, given, I think open source by Google. Uh, they have like a, some basic open source models that you can use. And we pulled one, pulled one out and it worked really well. But they only recognized 80 words. And those 80 words were essentially random uh, and based upon uh, things and artifacts that you would find in San Francisco. Like, for instance, uh, in America, the fire hydrants are standard. <laughs> and they're very different that depending on what city you are and what state you are in. And we just could not find a fire hydrant in Hawaii that would reliably work with, with the um, with the AI, and it was simply because you know I was looking at the core data set because of all these different pictures. It was trained on where is Google from, the, the Bay Area, and California, and so. And similarly, along that, there was also words that had no contextual relevance to Hawaii, uh, such as skiing, and a variety of other words that just really wasn't quite relevant. And so, one of the takeaways from using this off-the-shelf AI is that um, AI is not contextually relevant for the indigenous worldview. And furthermore, it's extraordinarily biased for a specific type of Westerner. If you're from California in the Bay Area, the AI will work perfectly, uh, but Hawaii isn't there necessarily. And so uh, further takeaways from a technical perspective is how can we expand this? And so as Caroline was saying, how do we scale this? And one of the things we're working on kind of on the side is how can we make make the model expand per tribe because uh, every tribe is going to be very different that's usually a two date i think it's been downloaded on average like two thousand times a month uh it's open source and it's been forked uh, dozens and dozens of times i think maybe so maybe times. for the non-techies among you what that means it's been forked is just that we have been also giving workshops on how you can use this open source code and change the dictionary to represent your language. And you do that by forking it, um, <laughs> which sounds like I'm using a bad word. I'm not. Um, so, so then you, you download the app of the code and you create your own version of it with your own language. And uh, at one of the one of the workshops where we were teaching people how to do this, I, I was just loving the reaction of this one young lady from Alaska, and she was saying that her tribe they've been they've been working on on trying to figure out how to how to reclaim their language, but they have seven main dialects versions of their language. And, and there's always this discussion of which version is the correct one, which is the word version that we should you know, be propagating. And so she was just so fascinated by how easy it is to create this, this little visual dictionary. And she was like, immediately after this class, she's going to create seven versions and show it to her people. And 
um, show that you know all seven versions of the language can live alongside each other and they're all valuable. So that's something that I thought was very uh, inspiring. Yeah, and the typical response is, how can we add more words? And if you're familiar with AI, that's actually non-trivial. Um, we basically need to retrain the model. Um, and there's some few strategies that me and Caleb and a few others have been thinking about, how can we add, model, add more pictures? Like for instance, it doesn't recognize buffalo, which is significant to the Plains tribes. It doesn't actually recognize canoes, which is significant to the Northwestern tribes. Um, and there's just a whole range of limitations. And I think it's a really, it was a good exercise in understanding how biased AI is against the indigenous worldviews, just by the limitations. And these are not even intentional biases. It, another, another effect of the workshop in Honolulu was that we met Caleb and, and the other Maori and heard about their uh, very successful implementation of automatic speech recognition for Maori. And inspired by that and with, with their mentorship, we uh, got a grant to start working with a, a community on the north, northern part of Vancouver Island and um, started working on Kwakwala corpus collection for that goal of creating automatic speech rec recognition. Um, oh yeah, and I, one of the reasons why I chose this picture is because this was when I was visiting, uh, visiting them. Um, and we went to the beach and they showed me that underneath the rocks, there's these tiny little crabs. And it, I thought it's kind of a, a, a good picture to symbolize how, you know, you're at the beginning, you're collecting these, these, you know, just tiny little, tiny little bits and pieces for what's later going to be a big corpus and an automatic speech recognition project, but you have to start small. <laughs> And so uh, what is this exactly? So we have assembled, there's six of us, actually there's more, um, not, not pictured here, but we are an international coalition of uh, data scientists, software engineers, and nerd herders, and of course, knowledge keepers who are building, we're tackling a key problem in uh, a, a green, in unexplored territory, basically, in uh, AI. And even using that language there, it feels a little bit dirty. Basically, there's a lot of AI problems here that have not been um, uh, figured out yet. And so one of them, of course, is uh, polysynthesis. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But we were focusing on these languages in the Northwest uh, because they have this feature of polysynthetic uh, word construction. And that is significant because most tribes in North America and every, most languages in the world, if you think about every, if you think of the language, if you take a representative speaker from every single language and put them in the room, majority of those people would be polysynthetic uh, language speakers. Now, obviously, you know, English is much more larger language, but, and so it's a much, very common uh, phenomenon across the globe. And it just happens not to happen in North, uh, in Europe. And so we, uh, chose these languages and they partnered with us, these knowledge keepers, because they exhibit some of the most highly polysynthetic uh, phenomena in North America. Well, and they chose to partner with us because they share our vision of creating that automatic speech recognition system. And yeah, so we're very grateful to be working with them and uh, Mike already told you a little bit about some of some of those challenges of applying AI to any low resource uh, and or indigenous language. And so low resource means everything from um, there's not many speakers, there's not a lot of documentation. If, if there's audio or uh, some written documentation, a lot of times it's going to be analog and not digital. Um, so we don't have a lot of training data. Um, it's, it's hard to find people with the technical skills, not just you know, in, in the tribal communities, uh, 
look at any of the big companies, Google and whatever, they're all trying to find, uh, find the people, the resources with the technical skills to do AI. And then of course, also lack of funding. Um, some, of, some of those other challenges are that there's very diverse and sometimes co competing orthographies, the way a word is written. Um, in, in this case, this is a handwritten note by Franz Boas um, from, I don't remember what time, um, but this is a, a, an example of how at a certain point in time, Franz Boas thought that uh, Quakwala should be written. But later on in time, he wrote it completely differently. And so there's, there's diverse orthographies by, by community, by fraction, factions within the communities. There's geographical barriers um, and, and also lack of continuity, as in you, know, you have some, some external anthropologists or linguists coming in, being all excited for their summer. Um, summer project and doing something and then wandering off never to be seen again. And, you know, there's all these, all these challenges, but one of the main challenges and the biggest barrier to ASR is fundamentally indigenous languages are not English. And did you want to? It's your yeah, show. Well, my show. Uh, <laughs> And like Michael is mentioning, one of one of the reasons how they're fundamentally different from English is that they're polysynthetic languages. And this is an example that I, I am very sorry, I cannot pronounce it for you, but it's an example uh, of Kwekwetechuk. Uh, say and it's one word in that language um, that basically translates to a whole sentence in English. Apparently she wants to be an expert at dyeing straw. And the reason why we included this here is just to, to explain how many standard voice AIs assume that um, all languages kind of work like English works and that there's a finite dictionary of words. But polysynthetic languages take these word elements that are called morphemes. Um, you might know them as prefixes and suffixes and roots. Um, and, they, and they combine them. You, everybody learns about prefixes and suffixes. And roots. And roots. <laughs> <laughs> I never. <laughs> OK, maybe not. Um, anyway, there, there's all these little elements. And, and you combine these elements to to form one word and that one word can have a lot of information that information could also talk about you know the relation between the speaker and the listener it could also talk about uh the directionality of um of you know uh, uh motion that is happening and and so because you can combine all these elements in infinite ways there is no such thing as a finite dictionary. And that, of course, is a bit of a challenge for AI and ASR. Yeah, with the, uh, I've worked in industry on AI and basically the, the key assumption is that all AI assumes that most languages or all languages are a type of English and they don't have, um, polysynthesis where you're able to combine infinite amount of words. And so the, the, they build statistical dictionaries with finite number of words. And they then use in basically just like a simple dictionary, a statistical dictionary is able to predict the likelihood of a uh, phrase being said. And so, but you can't necessarily do that with the polysynthetic language because a word may never occur more than once in the lifetime of a universe because there are an infinite amount of them. And so, it's just very difficult. And so we need different methodologies in which to uh, approach this problem for AI. Oh, and as we're building this AI, we also can't uh, forget that ultimately our source data, when we're building AI, uh, we, what we do is we take annotated audio 
which is the audio that's been transcribed. And one of the, as mentioned earlier by Caroline, is that you need to have this uh, audio consistently organized. And, and so what you do is, what, uh, don't click these. <laughs> it's really confusing to me. <laughs> anyway, just click in something and it brings up, I couldn't see anything. Anyway, what basically what happens is that you need a lot of audio and you need to take annotated audio that's clean for the uh, AI to understand. So you take the audio uh, a wave file or an MP3 file, and then you have corresponding text with it. Uh, for indigenous languages, for English languages, this is this might be a tweet. This might be just, you know, the the the, the late night rantings of Jason Edward Lewis said on Twitter and you know, like talking about some sports team that you were know, whatever was going on with sports. Um and but this isn't true for indigenous languages. This is often our core data set is uh, stories, sacred stories, um, uh, stories, voices from elders who have long passed and sacred songs that are not necessarily shared with outsiders. And so as we're, we're processing this data, we need to be consciously aware that this data is intellectual property. And as intellectual property, it has value uh, to outsiders and, of course, also intrinsically to the creators and the, the creators of this data and the owners of this data. And we have to be very careful, like um, the Chief Sitting Bull's winter count scene here, we can't let these things be stolen and taken away from us because the Lakota no longer had access to uh, this winter count. It was sitting in the Smithsonian and they'll probably never ever come back to the Lakota people, not without probably government action, which is unlikely given America. and we have to approach this with the, with the extreme caution and care, ensuring that the, our partners, as we build this data, that are retain control of their data and understand what we're doing to data, and so that we set their expectations as they're building AI and creating new partners. That this is the proper way to do things, and the expectations should be high. Yeah, and I guess um, from the experience of a many year nerd herder, uh, there is an additional risk that if you if you ask some uh, technician to do something, if it's possible, they're they're not going to think twice. It's it's the challenge of doing it. So uh, there's a there's a high responsibility on on making sure that it's not just done willy nilly and that these protocols are being followed and um, and indigenous data sovereignty is being respected, like Michael is just saying. Um, yeah, and well, one of the examples for you know indigenous protocols uh, was when we were when we were talking with our our partners, um, our Quagyoth uh, partners. They, they gave us uh, access to certain stories. And then they were saying, this one story, we're allowed to use it to train the machine learning. However, um, this is a story that has to be told uninterrupted from beginning to end. It's not allowed to be told only partially uh, or only in an excerpt. And so that, that's something, you know, as uh, people who are trying to do our best to attend to these protocols means that we have to figure out ways of how do we train the machine without breaking up that story, without, without you know, um, training the machine with only parts of it. Um, yeah, so the technical solution there was to, when you train, AI, it's, it's a scientific process and it's well set up. I mean, those are standard protocols. And what you do is you create a training set, which you train the AI with. You create a, um, a test set to make sure that uh, whatever it is training is doing, going in the right direction. And then you have a validation set, basically three different data types. And the validation is what you use to derive your performance metric. Like, because the test and the training data set are so intertwined, they are. Um, you can't use that as their validation. And but there's various reasons for that, but I digress. So what, what happens though, is that we need to make sure that that story, even though we're 
only in analyzing it on the phrase level is entirely within one of those three buckets. And so that when the computer evaluates it, it sees the story, so to speak, end to end, regardless of how, because it's possible, it's a, it's a random uh, algorithm. So if you, if you disperse the story within those three different buckets, it may never be fully evaluated by the computer during a training run. Yeah, and here again, the Maori are, are our role models and um, are storming ahead, having really good articles written about their, um, their fight for indigenous or Maori language data and Maori data sovereignty and, and how they're making sure that corporations, large corporations don't get their hands on this, on this data and don't exploit um, Maori people for, for their languages and for their language data. Yeah, and just backing up a little bit, if you've not seen Peter Lucas's and Keone's talk, they, um, I encourage you to read this wire article on um, URLs at the bottom, or you can just look up Maori data sovereignty. Well, they also gave a talk here in the series. I just did, yes. <laughs> if you've not seen their talk, <laughs> they, 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 they're a traveling road show. They, they do quite a bit of talks. And um, what they've done is they've actually created an AI that performs with 85% success rate and higher which is quite amazing. Uh, the, bench, the benchmark for large scale AI, voice AI is 80%. And so being able to surpass even that is uh, quite an accomplishment, particularly given how they had minimal resources. They face the same problems as we do in the, on the mainland in that they have low resources. They have very limited financial support and they also similarly are, are communities that do not have uh, technical and uh, resources necessary to do all this. So it's quite amazing that they're able to do this and while retaining their sovereignty and being very ardent supporters of indigenous AI development. Okay. Um, <laughs> and why, why does it matter? Um, and yes, it's cool. Uh, on some level, it tickles my brain that we're building voice AI and using advanced technologies and ultimately with the goal towards building VR applications, which is ultimately just one way of saying that I get to play toys all day. <laughs> but it also means that it's significant because we need to own a technological narrative. Uh, this here is in the Denver um, Museum of Natural History. And if you were to look to the left, you would see cavemen. And if you were a little diorama of cavemen, and in between the, between the cavemen and then a, a settler's uh, colonial log house, to the right of this, you know, the natural progression of time, you have the, the Cheyenne village. And so it's just, when you walk into the museum, it's dinosaurs and you keep walking and you pretty soon you see saber tooth tigers and you see mastodons and then you see giraffes and you start seeing elephants and then, you know, the cavemen, the Cheyenne and then the, 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 settlers. the settler, colonial settlers. And so there is this kind of implied that by racism that in business, people are just museum pieces. We are primitive, stuck in an era, and no longer relevant to the modern world. And I argue differently because AI, there are these entire problem sets within AI that have not been solved simply because we ignore indigenous values and ignore indigenous uh, knowledge systems that uh, there's a treasure trove and wealth of uh, information and knowledge to be had, and it has to be done responsibly. Otherwise, we're just uh, museum pieces. We're just preserving a snapshot of a, a romanticized vision here, like here. Yeah, and in case you didn't catch that, those are actually wax figures of Michael's antiques. Yes, I think in the 70s and early 80s, they, they commissioned them to uh, stand there and there. You can see my aunt, she's in the back background um, carrying water. <laughs> I grew up with my aunt and it's quite kind of funny. She was, she was not someone who carried water. <laughs> that was for the kids and the boys to do. <laughs> All right. So I think we're pretty much on, on time. Um, so before, before we run off, we're excited to hear your questions and, and start the conversation with you and um, 
as you might have heard earlier when uh, when we were just chatting, waiting for the event to start. There's also some other um, activities that we're into, like Michael founded the Indigenous AI group at NeurIPS and um, what? No, you're pointing somewhere. Oh, did, did you want to do questions or how did you? Yeah. So well, yeah, were, were you ready for questions now? Is that what you, you're indicating in the slideshow? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Awesome. Um, well, thank you so much. I'm just going to make a note for the attendees. So you're welcome to write questions in the Q&A box below. We already have a good set of questions to get us started. Um, so, and uh, we'll take turns reading them aloud just because we closed the participant voice part because of previous name bombings. So, um, okay, um, the first question comes from Laura, which is how much data does someone need to record in order to create a reliable model with off the shelf tools? For a Western language, a you, I think the current, standard is 10,000 hours of annotated audio. Uh, this is for English or French or German. Um, these benchmarks, it depends on the language too. Like English is a very erratic language. Uh, if you're second, if you're, if English is your second language, then you would know what that means. It's basically, there's not a lot of rules uh, in English. And so you need a lot more data for English to work. Um, the Maori data scientist, uh, Caleb, who works with uh, uh, Peter Lucas and Keone, he, uh, he uh, he told me funnily enough that maybe English might be the hardest, why it requires so much. And so the Maori, they were able to build their high confidence model with only 300 hours of uh, annotated audio, which is quite amazing. And this may actually just be a assumption that you need a lot of audio for languages. And that might be just a bias because the English is so irregular and you need to account for that with the large statistical corpus. Hopefully that's a really long answer to your question. <laughs> Ten thousand hours of it's English. So if you try, <laughs> maybe so, maybe shorter so, if it's a regular language. So we don't know because a lot 10, of ten thousand hours if it's English. Um, Maori managed to do it with three hundred hours. Um, we have read some research where there were some good results with, I think, a hundred hours. Um, but it's still it's, it's something we're making. Yeah, it's still it's still quite a quite a feat to get those hundred hours of annotated audio. Um, and so what you're trying to do is uh, why what is up with all this data? What you're trying to do is capture as many different pronunciations of the same sounds. And so you know words, morphemes, whatever language you're speaking are composed of sounds, and everyone makes those sounds differently. And so the more voices you have in a data set, the more range of sounds. If you only have one, per, if you only had uh, Alex, it's really easy for Alex to create their own ASR with their own voice, but it would only ever recognize Alex. It would not recognize Jason. Um, and so if you create an AI using only Jason and Alex, then the AI would only recognize Alex and Jason. And so what you're trying to do is create a range um, and which is particularly important because the AI we're building is for second language learners, people who may not necessarily under speak the language. And so it's really important to have a broad range of uh, uh, voices in the data set to create these reliability. Amazing, thank you so much. Jason, would you like to ask the next question? Or, or, or not to put you on the spot, I was wondering if you had one you wanted to ask or, um, or Ty can read the next question. Um, oh, Jason here. Uh, no, let's get to the audience questions. Okay. And if, okay. if there's time, I'll ask, uh, I'll ask my questions. Wonderful, awesome. Ty, would you like to read? Yeah, this is more of a technical question, but Natalie asked, do morphological parsers help? I guess your point is that we'd have to radically change our ASR algorithms no matter what, though. Yes, actually, that's at the core of a lot of our work is dusting off 1980s and 1970s early AI work, which used parsers and finite state transducers. And I won't dive in too much in that, but that's actually the right track. Uh, it does still require modifying the fundamental structure, though, of the AI and the different data structures, just because of the nature of um, 
of po highly polysynthetic languages. Um, Thank you. Claudio asked a question about when you're working with communities for non-Indigenous people who are working with Indigenous communities uh, that don't have anyone with necessarily the technical expertise in AI, what would be an appropriate protocol to work with Indigenous communities to use AI to support language visual, vital, revitalization or vitalization? Well, I, I, I would... Um... Initially, the first, thing the first thing I did, um, my, my first thought right now was, uh, I'd, I'd be very Maria? careful. Um, yeah, so before before we even before we even go to the point of, you know, having AI technology or teaching AI technology, it, it has a lot to do with, you know, um, building awareness, um, teaching about the policy needs and creating those policies. Um, yeah, empowering the community members to to understand what that even means, like the AI technology. Um, you know, like like we were explaining earlier with that with that story where we say, okay, so if you say this story cannot be broken up, um, this is how we can solve that so that we can still use this story um, and we can still use it for, for training the machine learning uh, algorithms, but while also respecting your protocols and your, your needs. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of, a lot of what, what we do is actually alongside the technology, just, just, teaching that understanding and the awareness and, and working together to develop the policies uh, that then frame how we continue working together. And also, you know, we are also developing a curriculum to, to then teach community members how to do the AI themselves. If there's one thing you're forgetting to talk about is that, so when we started working with one of the communities, they couldn't even type their own alphabet or their own orthography simply because they were they well, just, they the state was mandating Chrome. You didn't want to tell the story, so well. I'll tell it. <laughs> <laughs> or you tell. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> so, so the the Macaw, uh, two years ago, I think uh, the Washington State Education Department mandated that uh, all of school systems use Chromebooks. And Chromebooks are not capable of, um, of writing in the Macaw orthography. So the, the teachers, as well as the students, had to go through this intricate combination of up to seven keystrokes to just write one character that they needed for the Macaw language. Now, can you imagine how frustrating that is if you have to do five to seven keystrokes for one character? And, and so one of the first things that, that we did once we found out that this is, this is you know, a serious issue, uh, we said, well, we need, to, we need to help you guys with this. And we assembled like a brain trust and had a, a representative from Google. We had a representative from um, Unicode. Unicode. We had a, a, a friend, colleague of mine from the National Research Council, Indigenous Language Technologies Group, who is specialized on keyboards. And then, of course, we had the Macaw uh, teachers and, and had them all in a virtual room because, you know, COVID, um, and, and figured out what is the problem and how can we solve this. And so, actually, a few months ago, we went live with. Uh, a, a keyboard that now works on Chromebook and uh, also outside of Chromebook so that it's a lot easier for them to type in their language. And so going back to the question of how do you start this project, or start an AI project with a community that's not technically advanced, you may not start with AI. You need to solve all the basics that the community needs. Like we didn't go in there and kind of roughhouse them into saying you need to produce this, this, and this. No, we stopped 
and begin to assess and understand what does the community need, what does the community want, and understand the, the needs of the, and it wasn't AI infrastructure that they needed. They just needed basic, the basic ability to type their own language. And so often you might not, it may be a while before you can actually do the more advanced things, but you need to address the basics. And if the community doesn't have technical skills, then you need to help them address that. Um, so Joelle is asking about multilingual models. Um, specifically, they're asking, do you see this as a positive development for Indigenous languages, or do you have concerns about this direction? In short, should Indigenous languages be included in multilingual models, or can you explain your concerns about doing this? I think it's academically interesting that you can translate uh, the word potato into Maori using certain search engines. That's interesting in a way, but utterly does nothing for the community. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> and that's again like my core problem is that they're interesting problems to solve, and these are amazing tool sets. And they probably spent millions of dollars of R and D and funding just to enable that for these indigenous languages without giving back to the community without investing in infrastructure for the community to do this for themselves. Like where is the energy and funding to enable Maori data scientists to do the translation themselves? Now, of course, the, they're going to do it themselves already. You know, the Keone and Peter Lucas and Tiku Media are on that path, but there was no investment in this work to engage the community, to conduct that work and to uplift them to actually be able to do this kind of interesting work. But I, a Montana boy, am able to translate the word potato into Maori using my search engine, which is interesting and cool. Uh, and they spent, a, they spent a lot of energy and effort to do that, but with no fundamental giving back to the, uh, to the community. And I guess my point is there's nothing innately wrong with that from a technological perspective, but the entire process in which it was developed is, was fundamentally flawed. Uh, they need to engage with the community. They ought to have a do they want, do the Maori want potato to be translated in form for them? Is that necessarily necessary to do the search? Um, and I would argue probably not, honestly. They would have asked, why don't you help us build keyboards for our language community? How come you don't have enable more multilingual um, devices uh, just for as your basic infrastructure? We shouldn't have to go through this very convoluted process. And because uh, Caroline's amazing, she was able to get Google on board and able to push a software update. And there we go. <laughs> That's the micro needs to get off the soapbox alarm. <laughs> You'll mute yourself when it goes off. Awesome. Thank you. Um, there's a lot of people writing. Thank you. And really appreciating everything that you've said so far. Um, and I want to encourage other people, if you have questions, to write them in the Q&A box. Maybe right now, Jason, this would be a good time to ask your question. Well, actually, it got, it got addressed. Uh, I, I wanted to go back to that example about the story that can, that can, only, be, it can only be told all at once and how that poses problems for how the machine learning systems you know, normally sort of parse the language to process it and learn from it. But I think that um, I think that's one of the most like like deep and interesting places for thinking about this work is exactly where the indigenous protocol comes up against the protocols for how we built these machines you know to process the data and the language and and really trying to figure that out i, it, I think is is super important um if we're gonna make it possible for our communities to embrace these technologies and make them useful to them you know um and then I just wanted, I just wanted, I wanted uh, Caroline to uh, just explain to us what a nerf herder is. The nerd herder. <laughs> nerd herder. Sorry, not nerf herder. Nerd herder. <laughs> not nerfs. Nerd. So, so <laughs> nerds like like Michael, um, they have brilliant minds, um, but they're very similar to cats in the way that they do not like people telling them what to do. And they also love to get distracted by shiny objects, <laughs> toys. <laughs> so a nerd herder has to do this delicate diplomacy of uh, keeping them on track, uh, making them believe that 
they themselves came up with the idea, this is what they want to do, and this is what they want to focus on, and then try to keep the distractions at bay. That's my job. <laughs> okay, excellent. Yes, Got it. Thank you. Um, uh, earlier, I saw that Samuel had his hand raised. I don't know if he lowered it again, so maybe no more questions. Um, Samuel, can you um, type a, que a question, perhaps? Oh, it. I think uh, it was typed, and Samuel wrote, thank you so much. Um, I was wondering, maybe um, because you had touched on it a bit and said you might come back to it, can you speak a bit more of kind of the work that you've been doing in coordinating some of the indigenous AI for NeurIPS and other kind of some more of this like outreach work? I know we chatted a bit about that beforehand, but just so that people who are um, joining us in the webinar can hear a bit more yeah, about if that. You, if you're not familiar how we met all these amazing people, um, so it started with a bowl of noodles. <laughs> and how we met uh, Connor Quinn and Alani, and Alani introduced us to Jason. And through Jason, we made contacts at NeurIPS. And, and so this, this random journey has uh, enabled us, if you're not familiar, NeurIPS is a, one of the biggest uh, AI conferences in the world. And it, it's like where all the premier research has gone there. You, know, you find Facebook and Google and IBM and all these large scale corporate entities and researchers presenting their work. And, and so we have had the honor you know, and since the 2020 last year was the first time we created a, our affinity group. Uh, we are now fiscally sponsored in the United States. So we have um, um, a nonprofit status with, from Natives in Tech. And I think she's even in the, Andrea. our technically our boss, Andrea Delgado also is in the, in the so I'll be nice and say nice things about it. <laughs> <laughs> and so we, yeah, so uh, we are now ramping up for NeurIPS 2021. Um, we're tentatively planning on a four hour workshop and we're currently finalizing speakers and panels for that. So, so we will be at uh, NeurIPS 2021. And looking forward to next year when they'll be in person. Awesome, thank you. Ty, would you like to read the next question? Yeah, and so Jade asked, um, I've got a friend um, looking to make a Tlingit language app for her dialect. We've got some technical skills. Are there GitHubs or other resources you could recommend as a starting point? So there's some really interesting tools i think caroline would have to give you a link so the the national research council has a indigenous language technology working group and they've open sourced everything and uh one of the cool tools that i was working on uh recently with some interns from my university is the read along studio and what it does is it takes a, a audio and annotation and that you can create the read along basically like a what it does is it puts a little bouncy ball on the words for you automatically using AI that they build and it's not true ASR I mean it's pretty cool and it's amazing what it does uh, and, but it's in a way to rapidly create tooling so that people can kind of see what a word is spelled like and then uh, then they can kind of understand the relationship during the phonetic spelling and the um, um, and they can hear yeah. And they can read along and they can read along like if it's a if it's a children's story, they can read it with together with their kid practice pronouncing it. So it's it's a really great tool. Um, but it's also open source. Um, everything they do is open source. Maybe yes. you can give like a link to their work. Um, yeah, it's called the read along studio from the National Research Council. I am um, who a key. Um, we gave the URL. It, if you can put out h u a k i i dot indigenous ai dot dev um on there you'll find the link to the github um and then you can get the source code from there um there's a variety of other tools i think the nfc though has the most advanced interesting ai stuff out there though thank you and i can also add that um link to our uh, website too in our resources oh yeah that would be good because um as Michael mentioned earlier, he gets distracted if I do stuff on the screen and he doesn't see the, the regular faces anymore. So I was trying to figure out how to how to find those links now. I'll, I'll send them to you, Alex, and then you can add them to the to the website. 
Wonderful. Um, yeah, I'll totally add those. And also for everyone who's attending, if you have friends or colleagues who want to attend this, um, like our website has like our videos. And thank you, Michael and Caroline, both for the shouts out of the like past recordings of events with uh, the Peter Lucas and Keone event too. Um, yeah, um, we have another question. Um, Claudio writes, uh, in 2022, the UNESCO Decade of Indigenous Languages starts. Do you know of any tech initiatives or special groups to support those efforts with technology? Um, anything to coordinate efforts across languages and communities? Well, there's us. Caroline's <laughs> nodding not in their head. No. <laughs> you can't say no, no. <laughs> I think, uh, well, yeah, so as far as large NGOs, they have a tendency, like if you look into UNESCO and you look into like what they're doing, what's the UN doing? They're focused on endangered languages that have 100,000 speakers uh, and they're creating large corpuses and doing language uh, preservation and re reclamation work and mostly in Africa and South America, simply because for them, it meets the criteria of a language that's endangered, but it doesn't meet the criteria of what we're interested in, where languages where you may only have a dozen speakers, uh, which is quite common in North America, unfortunately. And there really isn't, other than the, the standard NGOs that unfortunately gobble up all the uh, grant money, I won't name them <laughs> in America, but um, there, other than that, there really isn't a lot of innovation. Like I know there are a few professors out there. I always forget his name. He got a Greek last name. Papadios, Papala. Um, there's an anthropologists doing really good work as individuals, but as far as like a cohesive unit, coordinated effort. The closest thing would be NRC's Indigenous Language Technology Group. Um, uh, again, which will provide. Like there's not, I mean, there's, of course, there's, you know, other organizations like SEAL um, and, uh, you know, like the, the language consortium, whatever that's called, uh, indigenous language programming, but um, they're not necessarily focused on AI necessarily. Like there's, like, there's a lot of traditional old school organizations doing work. Um, Ty or Jason, did you have another question you wanted to ask? Uh, I wanted to, um, can you talk a bit more? Actually, I mean, I, I think Alex already mentioned this and you did a little bit, but I just want to talk more about like the Indigenous AI group. Like what is, like what's the mandate? Like sort of how would you describe what it's trying to do? Yeah. So I even did take this uh, opportunity to answer Michael Mueller's question. Um, yes, we are having a uh, Indigenous in AI was founded to make sure that Indigenous voices are being represented at NeurIPS and ICML. And we actually basically just have to say no a lot to a lot of conferences want us to attend, but we don't have the bandwidth. Um, but the main goal is to make sure that Indigenous research has an opportunity to interact uh, with other mainstream researchers. Like when you go to NeurIPS, uh, you will find researchers that the, the highest ranking researchers from Amazon Alexa or IBM Watson or Google's Facebook and or the, the lead, I forgot his name, dean of, um, uh, of these universities who are doing extraordinary research. And it's a lost opportunity that indigenous researchers are not being able to have the opportunity. And so we are elevating their voices. Um, next year, we're gonna start focusing on creating travel scholarships for when we start doing this in person. Uh, this year, we're gonna be participating in a virtual poster event. So if you know anyone out there, it's an open call, doing AI research in their master's or PhD, we're interested. And it's an opportunity to put down the resume that they put the poster at NeurIPS, which is very prestigious. You know, that's, a, that's a resume of item right there. <laughs> and, and so that's our main focus right now, um, getting people to these conferences and helping assist uh, researchers conduct you know, academic work in this space. Uh, we kind of have a bias to our language technology. Um, so we're trying to diversify because <laughs> that's all our friends. All the friends we met through Jason was um, <laughs> language researchers. <laughs> so we'd be really interested in object recognition people too, by the way, if you help us build that model. <laughs> Some robotics people. <laughs> yes, anything. Yeah, we they're out there. It's just they are. Yeah. 
didn't you just recently add a new board member? And yeah, so we're we to diversify ourselves. Well, we're all unfortunately men. Um, there's four dudes on the board. We recently added Crystal, who was an indigenous native. Is that what's called, uh, Jason? Indigenous oh, Crystal native. from bio the bio, the the native bio data. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, she's one of our leaders, and uh, trying to and she very awesome. sardonically said, well, now there's no longer just men, like, well, that's good, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so, but also it represents, there's this whole ocean of research within the bio space, who in many ways, they're more advanced than the machine learning space because they had to deal with these data sovereignty and privacy on an internet level. And so there's a really a lot of interesting, that could be another potential speaker, by the way, uh, Alex, it's uh, Crystal, Crystal Sosi. She's awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. And um, there's no more questions in the chat. Um, so maybe because this is around the time we were aiming to wrap up anyways, but I was wondering if there was anything else you wanted to close on a kind of final message to leave people with before we wrap up for the night. Um, 